1938. 1938, that's not that long ago, our nation passed the Fair Labor Arts, Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938 that outlawed child labor. It was 1938. My parents did not get that law. I don't know why they thought that. <clears throat> but until then, until then, it wasn't unusual to find a child that worked in a mill, sawmill, cotton mill, manufacturing plant, coal mine. And we have uh, horror stories of children being killed, uh, injured, all because of the danger of working uh, in, in these conditions. And in 1938, we outlawed those. And we have the, the, the you, there are certain situations that you cannot have a child work in because it is against the child labor laws. I'm wondering. We're going to read it today about a church that God used to reach the entire Roman Empire. But yet God seems hesitant or unable or to even use this church to reach even Williamson County. I'm wondering to trust us with a task as hard as he trusted to Antioch. Would he be violating the child labor laws? Chapter 11 in the book of Acts. Stand with me in honor of God's word. Let's read together. Those men who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and uh, Antioch. And speaking of the message to no one except Jews, and there were some of them, Cypriot and Cyrenian men, who came to Antioch and began to speak to the Hellenists, proclaiming the good news of the Lord Jesus. Now the Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. And the report about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. And when he arrived, he saw the grace of God, and, and he was glad, and he encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with a firm resolve in their hearts. For he was a good man, full of faith. A large numbers of people were added to the Lord. And then he went to Tarsus, and he searched for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to the Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught the large numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. For a whole year they met and taught a very large number. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Work in our lives. So that the people who know us will know again what the word Christian means. And we pray this in your name. Amen. We have a, we have a system. We've got everything systematized, mechanized, figured out. If you want to do this, we know how to do that. So we'll give you the plan. We'll give you the notebook and we'll sell you the policy. And we know how to church, uh, start churches. We know how to start regional campuses. There's a way you do it. Uh, there's a way you get the people together. There's a way you talk about the vision. And obviously, Paul and Barnabas didn't know a thing about starting a church. Now, let's just think about it. Let's say that you and I were going to start a church. Let's just say we had agreed together that we're going to be the church here. And now, and I tell you, okay, if we're going to get serious about this, here's what I want you to do. For the next year, for the next year, every night, I want you to be here because we're going to do training every night for the next year. Remember, this is the first century Roman Empire. There are no Christmas holidays. There was no spring break. There's no 4th of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day. Every night, seven days a week, the church met, shared dinner together, and then they worshiped and had discipleship every night. Now, you're looking at me going, that doesn't make any sense. That's just not reasonable. That's not possible. Don't you understand how busy we are? Understand the people in this first century church had less control of their time than you and I do. Okay, they were slaves. They were the poorest of the poor. Uh, they worked uh, manual labor. They couldn't get off till their boss said they were off. Well, in the early church, we found that the bosses would close up, come to church early, eat dinner, and they would eat all the food. By the time the poor guys got there, there, weren't, there wasn't any food to eat. So Paul had to say, if you can, eat at home and share, and share with those who have less than you. It was an early controversy in, in the church. And so that was the pattern. They would come to somebody's house, they would eat, they would disciple every night for a year. Now think about that, and let's now just stop, just hold that in your head, and let's stop now to confess some very, very 
bad evangelical theology. Uh, uh, and now, okay, I'm Baptist, never been anything else but a Baptist, can't spell Presbyterian, I don't care about anything. Okay, I'm going to talk about Baptist. Now, if you talk about Baptist and you're not family, then we'll probably fight, but I'm family. Because of, uh, it's really hard to figure out how to measure if somebody's a real Christian. What we, what we measured was baptisms. How many baptisms do you have? And every Baptist preacher was always introduced by how many baptisms in the church. This is Reverend so-and-so of First Baptist Church, uh, you know, resumed speed, Alabama, and he had 100 baptisms in his church, da 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 Okay, what gets measured gets done, right? So if you're going to measure baptisms, we know how to baptize people. We focused on getting people baptized. And we focused so well on getting people baptized that we would baptize you, and then we wouldn't even help you dry off. We would go get somebody else to baptize. Okay, because that was a big thing. Now, the result is we have now churches full of infants who are trying to address the needs of postmodern, secular, post Christian America, and we can't do it. Because we have a church full of infants and we haven't done the serious work of growing again. The invitation to be born again is a command now to be grown again. And this is a very difficult process that most of us don't do. Most of us think the transformation is something that super saints do. I, my, I gave my life to Christ. I was baptized. You know, I come to church. I'm, but that transformation stuff, that getting serious, that's, that's for somebody else. That's for anybody who follows Jesus Christ. It's not an option. If you hang around Jesus, you're going to be changed. You're going to be transformed. The way you think, the person you are, the way you live, the things you want, those things will change. And it changes in a very uh, uh, intentional process. What do you think they did? The only thing they had was the Old Testament. So Paul, what you and I call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. So Paul is teaching them from the Hebrew Scriptures how Jesus is the Messiah. We know from the early, uh, the early work of Paul's missionary journey that he would go into a city, he would go to the synagogue, and from the Hebrew Scriptures prove that Jesus was the Christ. So they began to understand this great salvation story of God throughout history, and they understood Jesus' place in it. The thing that happens when you read that is you begin to understand that what is broken we cannot fix. And you can't make yourself good enough to deserve the love of God. You can't get enough points so you can cash them in to let God let you into his presence. And you begin to realize what a mess you're in. And that's hard. And then you have to take off those things that are in your life that don't belong to Jesus. Take out those things that don't help you get to God. Now understand what we're saying here. We're not saying I'm going to pray that, that Jesus won't let me go to this place where I always get in trouble. There's a place, and I always get in trouble when I go there. So, Jesus, I just want you to pray, and I just want, just don't give me, just don't give me the temptation to go there. No, you say, I'm not going there. I'm not, you can point a gun to my head. I'm not going there. You can drag me with horses. I'm not going there. I'm not going to do that anymore. That's a decision of the will. When you begin to work that out, then the other thing happens, and Christ fills you up with who he is. When you made a little space, when you make a plan, when you throw that junk out, Jesus comes and fills that space. It's important to make the two happen together. You just don't throw the stuff out and end up empty. Empty doesn't help. It just makes a lot of racket. All right? Does that sound like any Baptist you know? I'm going to take those things out of my life. Then I'm going to fill my life up. And how do I do that? I want to study Scripture. I want to read Scripture. I want to know what Jesus knew. I want to, I want to understood what he, uh, understand what he taught. I want to want what he wanted. I want to understand how Paul applied that to the lives of real people uh, and, and in places like Ephesus and Galatia. And I want to know all of that. And I want to get so focused on that. So as he writes the Philippians, the only thing I want to know is the power of Jesus and his resurrection and the glory of his crucifixion. That's what I want to know. That's the only thing that matters. Now, you're looking at me going, that's not realistic. That won't work. We don't have that kind of time. No, well, yeah, you do. Uh, but you may not have enough time to watch all the television programs you want or watch uh, another video of Dancing Cats. You just may not have that time. You may not be really good at your video games. Uh, but you do have the time. 
and you create that capacity, and then something happens. Once you begin to go through that process, people begin to notice, and the transformation begins to make the sermon happen before you ever say anything. Early, early chapters of Acts, Acts chapter 3. Uh, Peter and John are going into the, to the temple to pray. A man calls out in the process of their conversation. They pray for the man. He's healed. He has been crippled now. He is walking with them. In fact, he's jumping. He's making a lot of racket people are beginning to see. And, you know, he's testing out his new legs. So he's there. The religious leaders confront Peter and John, say, you don't have the authority to do this. You don't have the power to do this. But, and the Bible says, but they couldn't say a whole lot because the man that had been healed was standing right there. It's hard to tell somebody you don't have the power to do something when the guy you healed is standing right in front of everybody else. Legion, Mark chapter 5. He comes, gets in demoniac. Uh, 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 Legion filled with more demons than he can count. There's a whole army inside my head. Jesus heals him. The friends from the city, the, the, the citizens from the nearby town come and they see Legion sitting in the feet of Jesus, fully clothed and in his right mind. And that kind of power scared the city to death. What happens when people see changed lives from serious discipleship? You read the headlines of the paper that I did. Open the paper this morning. Mess. And how it's destroying the lives of people in Tennessee. And what we got to do and what, what, what the experts say we need to do. Listen, how many jails can we build? How, how, how can you cut off the supply of all the cold medicine that people use to cook this stuff? That's not the problem. That's a symptom. What's the problem is that there's a Jesus-sized hole in these people's heart and they're trying to kill the pain of its absence with meth. Maybe they're trying with pornography. Maybe they're trying... Uh, of alcohol or cocaine or any kind of other juice or abuse because they don't know who they are in Jesus Christ. They don't know that Jesus died for them, so they're trying to fill that emptiness and that pain. That's evangelism. That's not another program. Not another idea. It's just evangelism of you, broken, wounded, healed. The answer to this crisis of despair is the hope of Jesus Christ. Amen. The power of this hope is love. In you, going to your friends, sharing this simple message out of the overflow of what you know I wonder if what is holding God up is he's waiting for you and me to grow up, to be man enough, woman enough, adult enough, to walk through the door that he's now opening.